Nadia Ryman and Molly O'Toole received the first Pulitzer Prize for audio last year, along with the This American Life team and um, Emily Green from Vice. And uh, Nadia has been re- making radio for a long time. We actually know each other from StoryCorps. And she's currently producer at This American Life, uh, was a, before that senior editor at Latino USA, um, and before that at StoryCorps and has also worked in other places. And Molly is the immigration and security reporter for the LA Times based in Washington. Previously worked for foreign policy um, and the Atlantic and the Huffington Post. And Molly is also a graduate of the NYU Global Journalism Program. And I know I have some of you in my class that are in that program. Nadia, my first question for you is just, you know, what was your goal with this episode? They're going to be like, how did the idea originate uh, for making this show? I've been covering, I've covered immigration and led Latino USA a little bit at StoryCorps-ish as much as you can. <laughs> um, and uh, and at TAL, I kind of started right with the interest right in it. Um, and so just by keeping track of what was happening in reporting, I saw when the migrant protection protocol showed up, it seemed to me like there were going to be far reaching implications to this policy that um, were probably going to last even if the policy was ever taken away. And I followed a bunch of really amazing, smart immigration reporters, which include Molly, and I like read their work. Um, and I would talk to sources on the ground that I had there as well. And everybody was sort of pointing at the same thing um, that it was a big deal, that it was had real far-reaching human implications. And for some reason, like when I would talk to people that were not inside like immigration reporting circles, like it wasn't gelling how big of a deal it was. I think like people were just kind of thinking that it was like a lot of like policy, blah, blah, blah. And like, they just didn't really understand what this actually meant in a way that I felt audio could really do. Cause I think um, audio can be super intimate and can bring you into like almost the internal lives of people in a way that's very unique. And so I really wanted to take people into what this actually meant. And I wanted to show people what a policy that we had created was actually doing for humans. And so I started to just sort of think about how to cover this for TAL. We're a really idiosyncratic, weird beast. So sometimes we, you know, we have like a concept, but then it's like, well, who is like the character and who's going to have the emotion and how are we going to do it? So in all the coverage, like the thing that I thought found the most interesting and that struck me the most was hearing from the officers that had to execute these policies because they were like the people that had to sit there and talk to migrants and hear whatever horrible thing they'd gone through and tell them, sorry, you can't come in. And so I wondered what their internal lives were like and how they were feeling about it. And then um, when I read Molly's reporting on it, it just felt so like human. And she was able to get so many voices that just, that they talked to her like they were talking to people and not like they were talking to like some kind of like stuffy reporter. And that was really good for radio. Um, And so that was my first step sort of is like seeing Molly's brain being like, okay, if this person wants to work with us and make something, then I feel like I already kind of knew then what I wanted the rest of the episode to sound like, like I wanted to then also hear about a kidnapping because I knew that that was happening massively. And I also knew that people thought like, when you think of people getting kidnapped by cartels, I felt like most average people thought it was like random, like single men that were coming into work still for some reason and like it wasn't gelling that it was like families with kids you know and so I wanted that to be a part of it and then once like those two pieces were sort of coming together I knew that the third thing I wanted to do was to show people what were these kind of camps that we that our policy had created on the border and I wanted people to understand what it was like to be in there and who were the people that were actually there So it sort of started off as like a concept of like, this feels like an important policy that like, you know, is getting covered really well in this very specific enclave of like coverage, but I don't feel like average people get it. And I feel like radio can do that, can like bridge that gap. And then once Molly was on board, then it was easier to shape the rest of the episode. And then it all just kind of came together in a very whirlwind, very quick way. Um, So there was like a lot of like back work. And then once we started making it, it was just like, boom, 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 like super intense. Like I would say like a super intense, like six weeks having it come together. And was this the first time that the two of you had worked together? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Poor Great. Molly had like the most like whirlwind introduction to radio ever. <laughs> like it was just like, it's not at all. Like normally we take a lot longer, but like, because we wanted to get the story out and then like one of her sources wanted to go on the records and we were like, ah, we got to get it out before like other people get this person on the record. So everything kind of fell up. And I think like you were getting married to in between, like there was like everything was happening at the same time. And I kept being like, I'm so sorry. It's not usually this wild. I promise. That was a good, it was a good introduction. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I was going to ask you, Molly, like, so you're primarily a print reporter. So how did you feel that producing radio was different? Oh, my God. In so many ways. It was so different. Uh, and, and people, and, and Nadia was especially good at trying to sort of ease me into it and be like, you have to understand that it is different. So you can't just approach the story in the same way way and I feel like she was she was being really gentle with me she was trying to sort of brace me for impact and I was like okay yeah 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 right but it's still storytelling um but no it was it was so different uh in a lot of ways so that that did take me some getting used to for sure yeah this is really my first foray into audio journalism where I feel like there are people who've been working in audio their whole careers Nadia included or maybe other people who are like sort of shaking their fist at me right now, because the very first time out of the gate, I got to work with This American Life, who obviously I'm an an avid fan of the show and a listener, but to be able to sort of work with the best of the best in audio right out of the gate uh, was pretty, uh, was pretty amazing. But um, there were a lot of things to think about. I mean, especially reporting on immigration and security under the Trump administration, you almost never have any cooperation whatsoever from the government, which I think we can sort of expect. So I work a lot with anonymous sources um, where you have to be really sensitive about um, their building their trust and keeping that trust and preserving their identities. And so that was primary challenge is sort of how to translate that kind of more accountability and investigative reporting. How do you translate that to radio? That was definitely one of our, our challenges and just thinking about different ways to tell a story I mean, is really freeing in some ways because I could write the best description of my life or attempt to with words of, of a refugee camp that was created at, at the, the direct result of U.S. policy, but it is never going to be as powerful as actually hearing what that camp sounds like. And so it was really, it was really freeing in some ways to be able to use all of those different elements of a reader or listener's experience in storytelling but it definitely took some it definitely took some getting used to for me in in being forced to think about not just the way things read but the way things sound and the necessary elements you need to capture in order to help someone understand a pretty complex policy but also to to make it compelling until you understand the human impact so it was definitely a learning curve for sure but I had some good teachers yeah And I mean, one thing that comes across like so strongly in this episode is just that you had that trust with the asylum officers and they're so candid with you. Um, And I was wondering, hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you build up the trust with those people so that they're, you're able to get that kind of powerful tape? I think most of it is time, really. I mean, I've been, it's a little tricky for me to talk about because some of those sources Obviously, besides Doug, who went on the record, are still anonymous. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I have to be a little bit careful. But from very early on in the Trump administration, and, and actually even before Remain in Mexico had been announced, um, I had been doing reporting on actually the border between Mexico and Guatemala, it, right after a few weeks after the 2016 election. And just knowing what President Trump had promised to do, I was sort of on the lookout because a lot of those things would involve essentially ignoring or violating U.S. law when it came to asylum and and other humanitarian law and and the sort of the foundation of immigration law, which is based on not returning people to harm. (laughs) So uh, I was sort of on the lookout from the very beginning. So early on, I tried to establish sort of to find and establish relationships with the people who were going to be implementing these policies on the ground. So not the sort of gatekeepers or um, the sort of people with the official titles at headquarters in Washington, but the people who would really be implementing these policies that at least from my very basic understanding of immigration law struck me as on their face that they would, they would be illegal. Um, So I was interested in that dynamic from right away. So I started very early on, probably 20, you know, 2017, trying to establish relationships with the sort of, you know, 
civil servants, non-political appointees that you don't normally hear from unless something is going really, really wrong within some of these agencies. So I started, um, you know, I started a couple of years ago talking to some of these people and then, you know, some one person leads to another person who leads to another person leads to another person. So I think it's, um, yeah, part of building the trust is putting in the time, which isn't always a luxury that we have as journalists. I think the other thing too is, and I think a lot of journalists do this, I'm not unique, but yeah, just trying to um, uh, speak to people as fellow human beings. I think a lot of the sort of compassion has been lost in immigration coverage in particular, and, and with some of these policies, their very goal is to dehumanize. So just sort of speaking people to human to human. But those are the questions that interest me anyway. So it's not like this is sort of a strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I find fascinating about what we do is we just get to talk to people and learn about their lives. So I wish there was an easier answer for that, but I think it just takes, I think it just takes time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could, it, I mean, it definitely paid off um, in the tape that you got. I would love for you guys to talk about the decision to have actors play some of the characters which is so unusual so how did you make that decision why did you know what how did you decide that it was the right thing to do and how did you actually work with them Oof. I mean it was like something that I think we talked a lot internally like also like the ethics of it I think from the from like the uh, journalism and sort of tape gathering part of it like we knew that um because Molly had worked with these sources for so long we knew that they would not be comfortable talking to us if we couldn't promise them some sort of protection audio is always so much trickier than that because molly can write about it and then there's you can just say a you know someone at uscis told me this and in audio like how do you do it like how do you anonymize somebody in audio and we thought about different ways of doing it we did the interviews with everybody promising them that they we were not going to out them we took them very seriously and we did the writing around everything is very carefully done so that they cannot be found out we like only were clear on locations with the one officer that wanted to be on the record, like things like that, that we did. And then we also, I think beforehand, Molly had a lot of conversations and correct me if I'm wrong, Molly, where you were sort of laying out the groundwork of things that they didn't want to say because they felt were too identifiable. And when we were doing the interviews, there were like, you know, at times when I would be like, well, I'm like the brute tag along. So I might ask you something that like, you've already discussed with Molly and I apologize, but you could just tell me like, I don't want to talk about that because it's too identifiable. And there were a couple of times when I would ask something just because I was curious and I would be like, I actually can't say that because it'll make me identifiable. And I was like, oh, sure, no problem. So we took like that precaution, like on the front end. And then on the back end, we internally talked a lot about how to do it. And we were, we like way different options. We were like, do we like distort their voice? so that you can't really hear it. But the the truth of the matter is that with like that type of stuff, it does one of two things. One, you can always sort of undo it if you knew how to use the right tools. And I we didn't want to put anything out there that would allow the government to like mess around with the audio and then figure it out. So that was one main thing. The other thing is that from like an aesthetic, like audio making point of view, it just makes it sound really robotic and detached. And so it, you kind of lose the humanity, which was the part of this story that was so alive in the audio version. And so then we talked about doing actors. TAL has used actors before. We had one story that I can remember on top of my head where somebody from the EPA that was talking about how they were sort of protecting documents that they thought the government was going to get rid of. And that person was, we used an actor. So we have a history of doing that and doing it well. And I felt comfortable like pitching that to the asylum officers as well, saying like, we can do this. But then we also talked a lot internally about like whether that would erode the trust with the audience and have the audience like, you know, kind of think about like, well, are you juicing up the emotion because this is an actor, you know, and we kind of ended up on the side of like, well, we just need to be super, super careful about the way that we work with with actors and we casted for a bunch of different people. It, it was a weird thing to tell actors because I was like, I don't want you to act. I just need your vocal cords. Like I need you to just like mimic exactly what this person is saying. I don't want you to fake cry if it feels fake to you. But if this person is emotional, like try to match the rhythm and the emotion of their voice. So we picked actors that already were kind of like game to do that. And then we just tested it out. And we had like some that weren't working and some that really were, some that really got it. We also played them the audio live. We didn't let them keep any of the audio or we didn't put it anywhere that was downloadable so that nobody could like have access to it. So there was like all of these precautions that we took. And at the end of the day, 
we just made it match the actual emotion in the tape as closely as we could. Whenever you would hear them getting emotional and their voice cracking, it's because the actual person did that. And actually, the actual emotion on the tape, I still think from the real AOs, not the actors, is way more emotional Mm. than what we got from the actors. Because when the actors matched it so much, it almost felt like it was too much, (laughs) even though it was the most real. Um, So we had to find like a balance where it was as close as we could without it feeling acted if that makes any sense. But yeah, it was it was something that we thought about a lot and we were very upfront about it because we felt like the best way to keep the audience's trust was to just say like, here's why we did this. And we need you guys to understand like, this is the way we can be, we can have anonymous sources talk to us. And I think ultimately for us, like as a show, the most important thing is being able to get to the truth of a story and get to the bottom of it. And if that means that somebody's gonna feel more comfortable doing that, if we have somebody else do their voice, then, I personally don't care about that. I feel like it's more important to get somebody to tell you what actually is going on. But yeah, it was it was like a, a fine balance that we had to think about a lot. The, I mean, I could just, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. But, if I could add to that really quickly, because I, I do want to stress for especially all the journalists watching that like that neither the LA Times nor This American Life like takes using anonymity lightly, like as you can tell. Yeah. Uh, from Nadia's uh, from Nadia's like explanation of of really like what we weighed and what the show weighed in terms of how to preserve anonymity. So I don't want to give the impression that we just sort of like throw around anonymity. You know, we have extremely high standards for using anonymous sources. It it has to be a circumstance in which someone is, has to be anonymous because they're facing eminent harm or death or professional retaliation. So whistleblowers, in other words, and and that's really what these asylum officers are. And, And actually Doug, the the officer who's on on the record who I had initially spoken to before he had left USCIS and actually formally became a whistleblower that was this circumstance and I do think anonymity has been really abused uh, not just in the Trump administration the Obama administration as well you know officials who are demanding anonymity for things that don't require anonymity and yeah. reporters who are sort of giving it too easily. So I just really wanted to stress that. And, and the stakes were real. And that's part of the emotion that you hear because they're basically grappling with this ethical and legal choice is do they sort of stay in this agency and stay in this job and sort of fight from the inside or even just like keep a way to make a living for their family Or do they leave because they are morally and ethically and personally and emotionally opposed to what they're being asked to do? And but the consequences are real. I mean, after our story came out, This American Life, the episode, and then also the the LA Times story, the agency sent out an email basically stressing that people don't talk to reporters and they were looking for our sources. So I just wanted to underscore that we don't use anonymity lightly and and the consequences are, are real. Yeah, thank you. Can you guys talk about working together as reporter and producer? Um, I think this is something that a lot of students have questions about. You know, like, how does that actually play out when you're making the story? I, I might jump in first because I'm, I'm curious what, what, what Nadia would have to say. But um, I'm just going to be, like, flat out honest in that, like, at the beginning of the process, I was very um, mistrustful, actually. Yeah, I had never sort of worked with a producer before, and I had never worked in audio before, obviously. And I'd never worked with This American Life before. I mean, I very much trusted the journalism that they do, but I was really mistrustful because I was really trying to protect my sources. And I was really concerned um, because it was my relationship with them. And I was really concerned about sort of letting letting someone else into that relationship because I was very protective of that. And as, as much of a, a, a fan as I, as I was of the show and loved their journalism and, and sort of like the values that, that they share with their journalism, the type of journalism that they do, at the beginning, I was like, okay, are they just sort of using me for my sources here? And that's a little bit what it, it felt like at the beginning to me, but it, all of that was totally wrong. <laughs> and pretty much as soon as we started working together, you know, I, under, I had a much better understanding of kind of what, what Nadia needed and how, how we could work really well together as sort of a, a print reporter, audio producer duo. And I think it was really helpful in part that we sort of redid the reporting together. It wasn't as if we sort of just used reporting that was like left on the cutting board from the LA Times story. I mean, we really re-reported, we really re-reported it together. And I think that was 
that was huge as well. But I definitely had a lot of a lot of learning to do. So I just wanted to be candid that at the beginning, I was really mistrustful of how that relationship was going to work. But obviously, it worked out really well, and it was it was amazing. I just well, it's like it's like a weird. Like, yeah, it's it's like a weird uh, thing. I mean, I don't know if it's this is the way that everybody does it, but we're just very hands on as like a shop whenever we work with somebody. And this is like, I totally understand, like, I totally understood like Molly's apprehension from the very beginning. I feel like any reporter that is worth their weight would feel the same way and would like, you know, I, I like totally respect it and I know where it comes from. I mean, and it's, it's, it's a strange relationship because ultimately like we need somebody to trust us enough to like let us like meddle and co-report and like their ideas and their sources and their stories. And it can feel really like, it can feel strange. And the reason why we actually do it that way is because when, whenever we haven't, we just like know what type of tape we need to get to make it work for an audio story. And then it's just like so hard to explain to people how to do that. If you haven't done it for a long time, that it just became more efficient and more effective if we were that involved and the type of shop we are, it's kind of like nobody um, pitches to work with somebody unless they really want to essentially like team up and work like really hands-on together so it's like I don't think we're the type of like producers who would just sort of hold the mic for somebody like we're we're in it because we also have questions and we're also curious about something and we also want to like get to the bottom of something so I mean we're extremely nosy and extremely hands-on like we were like like as a shop we like co-write questions we like are active in the tape like we will like talk to your people <laughs> with you or like alone, you know? And, and so I think that's like something that can take some getting used to. And I think uh, like Molly was like such a champ about it too, because it was like all of that kind of getting used to and understanding on top of this being like a particularly sensitive story with sources that she had worked on for a long time who trusted her, didn't know me at all. And I was just kind of like there tagging along. And like the timeline of getting the episode out was so tight that all of that, like normally there's like a lot more like, like talking and hashing stuff out and being like, how are you feeling? Let me explain to you why I'm doing this at this point. I don't want you to think that I'm doing this. I know you might think that, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is this, I'm trying to get you taped so that when you write it, like this will come across in this way. Like we did that some, but I think not as much as we normally would have if we were like on a quicker timeline. So that also like made it like at the beginning, I think a little bit like what is happening, you know, but, but I think, I think that's kind of like the fun, at least for me of working with uh, reporters and other media like that is that you kind of get to like, you kind of like get to learn from their expertise and hopefully you like bring some of your expertise and they also get something out of it. And then I think it's like at the very end of the process when I think everything just becomes really clear because you kind of are seeing like, you're like, oh, so that's why like we did that line of questioning. That's why we like asked this person the same thing like 16 times. Cause like, it is also like a thing that happens in the radio, right? It's like you, you sometimes ask somebody the same question in like 10 different ways because you like need their words not yours to put the story together. So there's like a lot of that, I think that's happening. But for me, it was like a really fulfilling experience. I learned so much from just Molly and how resilient she is in her questions. And just like, it's just the trust she had with these folks. And I also just felt really honored to like be able to shape this thing with her. I think people can also read Molly's print story for the LA Times. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing to compare is like mm-hmm. how, or how it was reported in print versus versus audio. So one thing that I was hoping you two could talk about is um, maintaining neutrality when you're reporting a story where it's pretty apparent that there are some ethically questionable things happening where something kind of bad is happening but like how do you approach that um as as journalists and how did and specifically for this story I think that's sort of the question of I mean it's the question of journalism but it's particularly the question of covering the Trump administration I think he's really forced journalists and journalism to confront that question in a way that is at least unprecedented in my short so far pretty short career. But I I covered the 2016 campaign. And so I was thinking about that question uh, from pretty early on. I mean, I think we we shouldn't turn away from the ethical and moral questions. I think we should turn toward them. Um, I think those are what listeners and readers, that's what they're grappling with also. And so I I don't think we should turn away from those those things. Um, 
that is the human impact of, of a lot of these policies um, that we've seen under the Trump administration. It is sort of, they're sort of, they present ethical and moral and legal quandaries and, and we should be engaging with those, not trying to avoid them because we are afraid of some sort of allegations of bias. I think that particularly in this space, we still need to be able to say that something is wrong. We still need to be able to say, this is what the law says. This is what they're doing. What they're doing is not following the law. I mean, that is actually objectivity. That is neutrality. That is saying what is happening. And to do otherwise would be a sort of false equivalency. And I'm not saying that that is easy as my email inbox every day um, or my <laughs> or my uh, Twitter DMs uh, will show. Many people are unhappy with that on both sides all the time. But I really think that that's our obligation and our responsibility as journalists. And, and the best way that I've tried to do it is to focus on the human beings who are, who are impacted by the policy, either by implementing it or, or being affected by it. And I think if you really focus on the human beings and that helps sort of, that helps your kind of moral compass uh, through trying to do the reporting. It's not a left or right thing to say what is happening. That's actually objectivity. <laughs> to do otherwise would be engaging in a kind of, uh, of subjectivity that, that um, I don't think we should be engaging in. But I def it has not been easy. I mean, I think even just in the last couple of days, you know, you can see the sort of danger of this sort of both sideism. And but I think it's really been a challenge for for the media. And I'm not saying that I've always done it right or that we've always done it right. But uh, I hope that that's part of what makes this story successful. Yeah, I pretty I agree with everything that Molly has said. I feel the same way. I always think that my job is to kind of be in a way like sort of like a researcher. Like I'm supposed to be, I have like a question, there's something I'm noticing and I'm going to go and figure out what it is. And if what I figure out looks bad for one side of people like I don't know too bad. Like I don't know what to do with that and I don't think it should be my job to then try to make that side fit something that's not actually happening. Like if it's happening, it's happening. It's kind of how I feel about it. I think that we as journalists need to not worry about what people think of us in a way. Like, I think that in this country, there's like a whole bunch of like, but you must be likable and everybody should, you know, agree with you. And I'm kind of like, well, it's not really my job for everybody to like me. It is my job to look at the world around me and tell you what I see. And if that's going to piss you off, then too bad. I, I think that we need to sort of like lean into that a little bit more and be just honest and bold. I mean, I don't think that we're always going to get everything right. And I think it's perfectly fine to say this was the mistake. And now that I've like found this other part out, this is what was really going on. And I think that what keeps the trust with your readers, listeners, the people you're reporting for is you just being upfront about where you are, what you know, and what you don't know, rather than you always being right necessarily. Absolutely. That's so interesting. Such an interesting moment to be doing this work. So I was thinking like, um, we can open it up to questions from students because I know that people have a lot of questions. Maybe I'll just ask one thing before that happens. I'm always telling my students like, get scenes, get scenes. And like, there aren't like traditional like scenes in the story. Um, so it's like, curious Nadia like how you thought about that and like how you know you wrestled with it yeah because we couldn't document things as they were happening it's not the same right. as the Matamoros when we were there and there's like a kid asking for money you know I, I think whenever that happens and I think it happens often with you know like I think some of the reporting I've done too with people in detention centers and things like that like you can't get scenes of somebody is locked up someplace like you can't really document something and to go back to like what Molly was saying about access and having less government access under the Trump administration like we also don't have access necessarily to going and documenting things live in locations as much with what we have access to I think one of the things that we did with the asylum officers was have them walk us through moments very, very carefully. So it would be like, tell me about like a time when, you know, like who's, I think one of the questions that we asked one of them was like, who's someone that you still, that you had sent back that you wish you hadn't. 
and have them like tell us like everything about that or describe like walk us through the first time that you had to say no to somebody or were there any cases that you were able to get in and like what were they and what did you say what did they say and there was this moment with one of them where they just talked for like 15 minutes and they went through every single step with this family that they had to like interview at the end I think Molly was like can you tell me something more can you tell me about a specific case and they were like that's it I just told you that case because they just like remembered everything about it and I can't remember I don't think that actually ended up in the story no it but yeah it didn't we we tried because it was yeah. like one of the sources was like a little hesitant about talking about so you're trying to build a scene but also which you do in print journalism as as well or you try to so you're talking about it, uh, building scenes or finding scenes. So the way we tried to do that is had to have them recreate scenes, but at the same time, they're trying not to give away details that would make them identifiable. So how do you spe describe the specifics and details of a scene when you're sort of the only person who was kind of there to witness and it yeah. immediately makes you identifiable? So in that case, the asylum officer was describing, wasn't necessarily comfortable giving us one of those examples so described what she, what the uh, officer said was a hypothetical, but then yeah, they, they were like, say you have somebody say, they say this, say, they say that, say that, then you ask them this question and say, they answer this. And they, they did the entire thing in the hypothetical. And I, I think like halfway through, they just like, were talking in so much detail. And halfway through, I remember like looking at Molly and just thinking, I was like, this is real. Like, this isn't a hypothetical case. And then Molly, like, being like the dog and journalist she has like asked them again well can you tell us about a specific case and they were like yeah I just told you a specific case we were like okay just checking so there's like things like that you do where I think you ask them to walk through something in a lot of detail and you know and if they and and, and I think one of the the more emotional moments we had were because they were sort of like back at that place they were like psychologically like reflecting and they were like thinking about it and so then they had the feelings that they had at the moment I think come up when we were doing the interviews so it's just like a bunch of just like making people go through the details and I normally like ask them I use like the words like paint a picture or like tell it to me like a movie because I've found that when I say describe, people are like, well, they were like five foot two and like, you know, they had brown hair. And I'm like, no, I don't care about that. I want you to tell me something about them that is like, makes them come alive as a human. So like, tell me like, was there like a way of talking that like really struck, stuck out to you? Or what was it about the way that they were like with their kid that you still remember? Like anything like that, that you still remember and you still would like tell your friends at like a dinner party about a person I think is the thing that makes a person a person. And so it was sort of like, I found that like tell it to me like a movie tends to work or like paint a picture tends to work. Another thing that I've done, I don't know if I did it with these with you Molly, but something that has worked in the past is like if you ask somebody something about them that has nothing to do with the story just to get a sense of them as like a human. Yeah. Um, and then you can use some of that in the writing to help the scenes come alive. I think that's how we handle it. We mostly had people relive stuff and then describe it to us since we couldn't be there with them. Our job was made easier by the fact that it was so emotional for them and so visceral that if you think about something really traumatic that's happened to you or that's really impacted your life or sort of changed how you think about things, you, you do tend to remember the details really vividly. So I think that that was really helpful is that they, all of these details sort of stuck out in their mind because mm -hmm. it was so emotional for them. And they were, they were sort of acting as whistleblowers, whether formally or informally. So they'd sort of been mentally or, or physically sort of keeping track of the developments, whether on like a personal level or a professional level. So that was definitely made easier when we were trying to sort of capture, yeah, capture the scenes as best we could. I, I was telling my students earlier, like it definitely, this shows how you can have a powerful story without scenes. Like it's like, you know, every rule, like the rule is proven by the exception. Um, so we have a couple questions coming in. Um, Hannah asks, how do you pursue sources, especially those sources who are initially against speaking with you without it feeling exploitative? With these super sensitive topics, especially in audio format, which is so intimate, I feel like that would be a hard and fine line to walk. In some ways, I think my my part of the story, as opposed to Emily Green's, in some ways was easier. And I do do a lot of reporting with 
asylum seekers and um, and with uh, immigrants and people who are impacted by the policy. But it was a little unique in that we we were actually interested in hearing from the people implementing the policy. So it was a little different in terms of, I do think we ask a lot of really hard questions, especially with people who suffer trauma and who have been through so much and, and about exploitation and trying to, to make sure that you're magnifying voices and you're not just exploiting them. I think those questions sometimes are harder on the other side, the people being impacted by the policy. Whereas for this segment, at least that I was involved in, we're talking about asylum officers. So that was a little bit easier, I think, in terms of that exploitation. And I think you just have to be really honest and engage with, I mean, that was the story, right? It is, I think a lot of people who were listening as well were asking the sort of same questions that we were, which is, what would you do in their situation? Would you stay or, or would you quit? And why or why not? So you just have to be really honest with the listener and with the reader about what their own motivation, what their motivations are. And I hope that as a journalist, you, like whether through reputation or the way you've written the story, that you've made clear what your motivations are. Um, and they should be <laughs> to get as close to the truth as as possible. So I think as long as you're, you're open and as, as upfront as possible, uh, with your sources, with yourself, and with the people who are engaging with your work uh, about what everyone's motivations are. I really think that that's sort of the best you can do. But I think my side was easier, and Nadia can speak to to the the other side. No, I mean, I yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, are, you, are you talking about like whether it was harder for Emily's story, like sort of um, striking think, that balance, or I think, I think what um, Molly was kind of referring to and this came up in a different question is like I think students are curious about pestering people for for further detail when they're you're talking about a traumatic memory or traumatic situation well there was like um one strategy that I think was like something I actually learned at StoryCorps that I found to be one of the most useful things when you're talking to people that have trauma which is um if they if you're asking them a question and this is like when you're actually reporting so I don't know I think beforehand you just kind of have to be like what Molly was saying very transparent and just allow people like space to if they need it I do a couple of things. One thing I do is I always tell people like, I'm going to ask you lots of questions. If they make you uncomfortable or you don't want to answer them, you can just tell me, I don't want to talk about that. And I will let it go. I'm not going to burst into tears. I'm not going to like storm out of the room. Like, but just know that I'm going to ask you like, that's my job, you know? And so that immediately puts, gives people like the agency to kind of say like, well, I don't want to talk about that. And it feels like you're doing something together rather than you coming in and extracting information from them. So that's one thing. The other thing that I, which I learned when I had to do interviews with uh, survivors of 9-11 or people that had lost family members because of 9-11 was if people would get upset and emotional, you would give them all the space they needed. So I will often in interviews, like if people need to cry, I will let them cry. And when they seem like they're taking a moment, then I ask them a fact-based question to give them a little bit of a break. So it'll be like, so how old was your brother when he passed away? Oh, he was 32. Oh, okay. Okay. And you were the, how many siblings are there in your family? Oh, there's five of us. Okay. So I do that for a couple of questions to let people sort of like regain their balance. And then I'm like, okay, so take me back to the day that you found out that your brother had died. Like, what did your mom say? And then we go back to that moment so that it doesn't feel like they're like in a really dark place. And you're like, yes, but how did you feel? But what did your mom say? And how sad were you? And tell me like exactly what you still remember when you think about your like dead sibling, you know, like it, you have to sort of think about how you would want to be handled if you were in that situation and realize that you're still talking to human beings at the end of the day. And like, I really strongly believe in not doing any harm to anybody that I'm interviewing, especially like everyday people. I feel like I handle official government spoke people and the spokespersons in a different way. Um, and even then, I mean, if for these, which who were like people that were having real raw emotions and who ultimately I think at the end of the day are like civil servants, I wouldn't ask them questions in the same way that I would ask of like Ken Cuccinelli, you know, or anybody that is like higher above. I think there's like sort of like an understanding that with greater power comes greater responsibility and greater holding your feet to the fire than with less. So that's also something I always keep in mind. Super helpful. There's another question from Charlotte. She's wondering how many officers did you interview in total? And did you talk to officers who had 
a very different opinion and felt like the Trump administration was doing the right thing. Sort of wondering, like, how do you decide to keep in, what to keep in and what to leave out? It a little bit depends on how you count it, because like in the course of my reporting on this policy for about two years, like how many asylum officers have I talked to is a very, that's a different answer than like, how many did you talk to for this sort of specific story? But obviously all of those conversations influence my reporting. I mean, every interview I do sort of builds this knowledge base that you then drawn. So, you know, I've spoken to probably a dozen or more asylum officers like over the course of those couple of years. And and probably about half of that for the the original story on Remain in Mexico that sort of connect got the ball rolling with this American life and eventually got us connected. And and I will say it's not as if it's uniform. I mean, these are individual human beings um, who are complex and have very different personal views and political views and life experiences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But people almost to an asylum officer thought that this policy was ethically wrong and and did not follow their training or the law which makes sense if you think about it and and you and you can also see that in that the the union that represents asylum officers were filing amicus briefs so along with so it was extremely rare for me to find someone who thought that this policy was totally okay and that makes sense because it goes it, it's fundamentally sort of like against what the U.S. is what U.S. asylum law is based on, which is that principle of right. non-refoulement, uh, which is kind of similar to this, just like do no harm policy. I can see how it could seem sort of self-selective in that the people who would want to participate were sort of already in this whistleblowing mindset. And that was true. I mean, obviously they cared enough about the policy, they were impacted enough to be willing to sort of take that and felt strongly enough to be willing to sort of take that risk and wanting people to know what this policy was really like. So, so it is a sort of self-selecting group, but it actually is pretty representative of at least my reporting because so many asylum officers really felt this way. Um, but in terms of decisions about sort of what stays in and what stays out and that side of things, I think that that's more for, for Nadia. Um, for us, it was, I mean, uh, yes, backing up everything that Molly was saying, we didn't, it, if it was something where this was an outlier group of people, I don't think it necessarily would have meant that we wouldn't have reported it. I just think we would have been, we would have been, we would have categorized it as such. We would have said like, this is a small enclave and they're feeling this way. And, and then we would have had like a big idea. Here's why it's worth paying attention to it anyway. Right. But I think we were pretty certain that it wasn't a small group, that this was pretty representative of how a lot of people were feeling. Enough people that we felt pretty comfortable putting it out on air as such. So that was one thing. In terms of like whose voices actually stayed in the story, that had more to do with like, we always think of stories as like sort of like the pieces are building off of each other. So a lot of the asylum officers told, told us very similar things, like very similar stories, very similar moments in like the timeline of how this policy was rolled out that checked out, which was helpful also for fact checking that they all sort of were pointing to the same steps in the timeline. And so there's no reason why we would just have it said three times. So we just sort of picked out what were situations, what were moments that were unique to them as like characters too, because they were all very different people. And there were moments in tape that I felt really highlighted who they were as humans. So those pieces of tape stayed in. And then moments were that naturally built together to like, kind of like a culmination. And the culmination mostly, I think, was shaped around like Doug, who was the one that was on the record and his decision to leave. So that was like a natural sort of like structural arc. And so the other voices were sort of backing up that timeline of how the policy got rolled out and how and moments where they started to question whether the policy was legal. Does that, I'm sorry, does that answer? I feel like I kind of rambled a little. Does that answer what Yeah, I know. I think it does. And it also ties into another question that came up about like, you know, at what point in the reporting process, do you see the structure of the story coming together? Like when you're doing a long print piece or a long radio piece, I mean, structure, of course, is like the hardest thing. How do you kind of figure that out? I mean, from from my perspective as being pretty, as being new to audio and especially sort of long form narrative audio. I, I struggle with that at the beginning. I was like, I don't see how this is all, <laughs> I don't see how this is all gonna come together. I had like a really, I had a hard time seeing it because it is different to think about structurally and the pieces and how you organize them than in a print piece. 
which I was very comfortable with, but I was like definitely outside my comfort zone in terms of trying to see how it was all going to come together. I mean, obviously the re- some of the reporting is pretty similar in what you try and do and the strategies that you employ that Nadia has been describing. I struggled with seeing how it was going to come together. And I, I continue to struggle as my NYU professors could probably tell you with how to struggle, uh, how to structure, excuse me, how to struggle, yes, but how to structure long form narrative pieces. It is really hard. I think when you have like sort of strong characters and strong emotions and strong voices that though, if you sort of center those in your piece, the rest sort of comes together. That's that's a little bit like oversimplifying it, but that tends to help me if I think about, okay, what are the very basics of what the reader needs to know in order to understand this context or this policy? But if really the sort of priority of the story and the, this this what it's structured around are those voices, I think that makes for the most compelling work when you're writing about policy, but that's just from where I come from. I mean, I, I want to say that structure is always hard. Like no matter how many times you've done it, it is always hard. I think it'll always be hard. I think for me, the two hardest steps are always pitching and structuring. And for me, pitching is hard too, because in our, the way that we pitch at TAL, we essentially write the story already. So we're kind of like, then it would go to this and then imagine this. And then like the end could be like this. You sort of already have gamed out where it could go, but you also are obviously reporting something else. So you have to leave enough room so that if, when you report something else happens and something more interesting takes over, then that whole thing is out the window. And then you have to like, think about a new way of bringing the story on stage. So it's, uh, it's always hard just to say that. And like, it, it, I, I don't think it's gotten any easier. And I think partially I just watch like the brilliant editors I work with and like my jaws on the floor and I'm kind of like, yeah, you are making something make sense. Cause I sometimes feel like I just bring like a pile of tape and I'm like, Bleh, I don't know. There's something here. I like parts, but I don't know. And then like my editor would be like, okay, <laughs> let's like go through and put this here. And what if it went to here for this one? I feel like I'm, I'm kind of like, I think that radio sometimes is kind of a blunt object and I'm kind of like a like an audio jock so I'm like where's the plot where's it going like where's the action so as long as there's like some plot driving it forward I'm like okay we have something like we can set something up as things unfold and in this one it felt like you know because Doug went through a thing and made a decision I was like oh Doug went through a thing and made a decision there we go there's like something we can hang at least like chunks of the story on so I think from like the beginning, knowing that Molly had access to this person and she knew him and she told me like everything that he had gone through, I was like, okay, well, there's a plot. So whatever else we gather, we at least have this chronological plot to kind of fall back on. And ultimately, if you tear apart the story, it still is very much built around that plot. There's just like moments then that like rise up that do have to do as Lamali saying with like getting characters and how many people come alive and like how that sort of plays. Um, and when I say that radio is more of a blunt topic just because like every time we make a radio piece, I can't tell you how many times we've made something and they've been like, just start at the action, like cut off all of the stuff you have at the beginning that you think is helping set up like your characters beautifully. I don't care. Get me to what's happening. Uh, one of my colleagues, Hannah, did this story called Five Women, this episode that's like about the uh, alternate guy, I think, and like the, the he got like, it's the, he had like abuse allegations. And she like, when I heard that, I was like, this is some type of structure magic that I just will never be able to think of because she just like structured everything, like kind of going like bird's eye view around this one moment. And I like want everybody who likes making audio to listen to that and help me understand how she came up with that because I still don't understand. But like, I feel like for me, put it in chronological order (laughs) first and then see where the most exciting beginning of that chronological order is and chop everything off. And like, I feel like in that sense, I'm so brutal. I've like killed so much tape that I love just because I'm like, it's not helping me get to the action of chopping it. And I just kind of do it that's ultimately what ends up working in some way, shape or form. But that might just be because that might just be because I'm more of like, I'm less sophisticated about it than I should be. No, the amount of, the amount, it's, I'm laughing because the amount of conversations I've had, like probably even as of like two days ago with my editors who were like, get to the story, <laughs> do it. Um, yeah. You're like, but all this beautiful setup that I thought of that just like, we'll get you to care. And they're like, we don't care. Get to the story. Get to the story. And then also like chronology is your, that chronology is your friend. It's it's not that it's unsophisticated. It's, it's the way that we as human beings sort of comprehend and ingest. I know every time I've been like, let's start here and they will go backwards in time. They're like, I'm so confused. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what I'm listening for. I don't know who these people are. And I'm like, really? Cause we're going back in time. This is fun. No. 
Um, I relate to all of that. So yes. And I also relate to just structure always being challenging and that's, um, but it's also like a fun puzzle to be challenged by and work out. And that's just like part of what we, what we do as, as makers. And I will say if like one of the best ways to test it out is if you just tell a random friend what your story is about and you watch their face and you see when they kind of like glaze over and when they get excited, like the parts that they glaze over, you're like, oh, that's not working. Like that, this is, this is like not getting people excited. Never underestimate like just telling other people who are not you, who are not deeply into the story to see what actually makes sense. Um, and the other thing that you brought up too, um, which is really important, is just having an editor, you know, having <laughs> playing your, your tape when you're confused and lost and you play it for somebody who doesn't even necessarily need to be an audio professional just a smart person with, you know, who's will listen to your tape. Um, it's just so helpful. And that's just part of how we make, how we get this done. This was a great conversation. So thank you both. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Nadia. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you um, so much. Really appreciate this. Thank yeah. you guys for having us. Yeah, so thanks for having us.